please have some candy if you the, the bags are being passed around i brought you all a little end of semester treat so i hope you enjoy that all right does everybody hear me okay okay all right ready yes really sweet thank you all right everybody we end our course today where we began asking the question wherein does human dignity lie I'd like to give you a few of my own reflections on that topic as you know the UN's Commission of Human Rights concluded, we all agree that humans have rights. We just cannot agree on what grounds them. I would like to suggest that they could have responded with one sentence. They could have said, we are all convinced that humans are more than matter. In that one sentence, a paradigm shift occurs. If we are all just matter, then there is no real way to harm or offend or treat a human being unjustly in the objective sense of that word. But we are all convinced that injustices are real murder, genocide, abuse, domestic violence, we all agree and take as our starting point, they could have said, that the prohibition of these actions as wrong is not just a social or mental construct whose aim is the survival of our species. We do not forbid or condemn such actions because they do not suit us, or in order to foster the perpetuation of the species. Rather, we take these actions to be inherently and intrinsically evil, committing a genuine crime against persons because both the perpetrator and the victim are harmed. While we believe, they could have said, that it is licit to use pest control on insects to farm animals for food and to hunt human animal uh, to hunt animals who are overpopulating in certain regions we agree that humans are fundamentally different than other animal species and that the same kinds of practices cannot rightly be applied to humans we can all imagine that other species might say the same thing about themselves, given the chance. We, deer, must do all we can to control the population of humans, which is threatening our forest. It is licit to take any and all action to eliminate humans, deer might say, but no harm to other deer is permitted. So we ask ourselves, why do we believe that it is not just a bias that we have favoring our own kind? How do we step outside of our own self-interest and locate human dignity in something objectively distinct about human beings? The first main reason traces back to the fourth century BC. It is that humans really do have the ability to know in the optimistic, robust sense of the word. In our age of postmodern skepticism, we sometimes fall into cynicism regarding human knowledge. 
and its ability to access things in themselves. We wonder whether we can get out of our own solipsistic worlds and access reality past our own subjective concepts. But we stand firm in our conviction that humans really can know truth, that is, realities that stand outside of ourselves. For example, when 100 mathematicians all come to know that 2 plus 2 equals 4, we take them not to be limited to their own mental constructs. Rather, we take their mental constructs to be conduits to a truth that stands outside of them. 2 plus 2 equals 4 is eternally true whether or not there is any human to know it. When humans are there and do know it, we take them to be transcending their own brains and touching, you might say, a truth that lies outside of their brains. This is what the ancient philosophical tradition described as the human mind or soul, that thing that could touch an intelligible reality that lies outside of itself. The human soul thus would not be just bodily. If it were, when we think two plus two equals four, all we have is our own brain's concept. But how can we guarantee that all 100 mathematicians' concepts will align with each other? The possibility of them not lining up is inconsistent with what we take mathematics to be capable of. The discipline of mathematics has a fundamental assumption that once a mathematical truth is located, its truth value is not dependent on your or my mental construct, nor on its matching the collective agreement of other thinkers, but that the truth value of all thinkers' concepts is measured against something that stands over and above all mathematical thinkers. This is to maintain that the human being is more than a body, and that thinking occurs in more than the bodily organ associated with it, the brain. This dualistic view affirms the value of the body and the brain specifically as critical and fundamental to human mental processing. But according to this dualistic view, as important as the brain is to our cognitive function, cognitive function cannot be reducible to it. The human has something transcendent about it. And what does transcendence mean here? That it can transcend its own concepts. It can access eternal and universal truths. We do not want to say that two plus two might equal five when one day it is more beneficial, practical, socially or economically advantageous for us to say so. Rather, we want to say that two plus two equals four is not the product of human brains or human society, but that there is something amazing about our ability to transcend our own constructs and latch on to something intellectual outside of us. Rabbits calculate, birds calculate, but if it were to their, um, but if it were to their evolutionary advantage to modify their calculation, they would, just as my cat modifies her calculations to catch up with the new location of her food dish. Humans do not generally think that this is what is going on when we know mathematical truths. This applies to first principles as well. The principle of non-contradiction, for example. A does not equal not A. That is a transcendent truth, not the product of a human community. 
What about the principle of identity? A equals A. One thing is one thing. One thing is not many, and it is also not something other than itself. <clears throat> the objective reality of mathematics and that of first principles is something we generally don't want to lose hold of. Otherwise, they lose their meaning. To say that they are only functionally true is to under undermine what we mean when we assert them. Similarly, we may take certain moral truths to be sacrosanct and not reducible to human generation. Isn't it true that slavery is wrong? That mutilation of an innocent victim is wrong? That the Nazi regime performing scientific experiments and mass extermination of whole sectors of the human population was wrong? Don't we hold these positions to be something more than the preservation of the species or of my particular tribe within that species? Much less socially acceptable, I will grant you, would be my claim that the same holds for beauty. Is beauty entirely relative? I recognize the changing standards of beauty in the history of art. To see, for example, the beauty of German expressionism when it would have been deemed ugly centuries before, or to claim the beauty of the work of Chagall or Matisse when they were originally described as bestial. But does this cultural relativity not come to an abrupt end? When we look, for example, at a massacre, can we ever evolve to the point of saying that massacred bodies are beautiful, even if they are the bodies of our enemies and we rejoice in our military victory and we can say that the outcome of the battle is good because justice can now prevail or whatever the putative gain is, can we ever cross the line and say that ripped limbs and spilt organs are beautiful? It may be some matter of debate, but I believe that beauty stands alongside mathematics and first principles of logic as transcending subjective human fabrication. We discover beauty and its standards. At bottom, we do not create them. All of this is to say that I believe that the human being has a transcendent soul. I do not mean transcendent in the religious sense, although I do hold that to be true. I mean here by transcendent that we have souls that are intellectual and by the intellect we can grasp truths and realities that are intelligible and stand outside of us. The world is marvelous. The human being has the rare chance to move beyond survival and comfort and explore the non-physical reality, mathematics, logic, physics, goodness, beauty, as given rather than fabricated, as genuinely standing over and above us rather than being our own fictions. If we have these transcendent minds or souls and rabbits and deer do not, it then makes sense why we can farm and hunt deer and rabbits, but why our standards must be different for humans. We must treat ourselves and each other as set apart from the rest of the natural order. No other thing in nature transcends itself. Other species of living things might have some kind of spiritual sensibility. I assume that the goldfinch delights. And I assume that the squirrel has some kind of faculty of contemplation. 
But this delight and contemplation would be in the manner of a bird or a rodent. It would, I believe, be a non-rational and non-universal sense of the term. The fish can know water better than I ever will, but it will not know its chemical compound or how to chemically alter it. The squirrel might contemplate the peaceful forest at sunrise, but not in the manner not in a manner that could replicate it in a painting, nor master and manipulate it by adding diverse elements to make that painting avant-garde. That is what Plato meant in the fourth century BC when he said that humans are strangely situated in the universe. We are like amphibian creatures. We have one foot in the physical order, but unlike any other kind of being in this physical order, we seem intent upon beholding truths, beautiful, timeless, non-physical truths. How is a physical animal yearning for things that transcend it? How did a beast such as we discover immaterial truths that are radiantly beautiful, glorious wonders to behold, such that our telos is to behold them and behold them eternally. Beginning with mathematics, which Plato held to be quasi-divine, he thought that it showed something almost divine in us, that we, unlike any other animal, can unlock the mathematical secrets of nature. How could this be animals that eat and digest and reproduce? Moving on to justice and goodness, he believed that it was unthinkably absurd to deny justice. Tell anyone in Athens, just having lost the Peloponnesian War, that there was no such thing as justice. When their innocent children have been taken captive as, sl as slaves, when some soldiers fought with bravery while other soldiers buckled and ran, there is such a thing as injustice, Plato maintained, as no child deserves to be captured and enslaved. There is a real difference, he said, between bravery and cowardice, and personal feeling has little bearing on the matter. From the axiom of justice, Plato reasoned to the form of justice. What a form is, he really could not say. It was just his second best theory that did better than reductive materialism, he hoped, at explaining his axiom. But later thinkers came along and said, I know exactly what forms are. They are ideas in the mind of God. Jewish philosopher Philo of Alexandria claimed this, followed by Augustine and Aquinas and the entire Western medieval tradition. Humans can move beyond what suits us. Exterminate the wasps, but do not exterminate the humans. Is, is this not something that the wasps would scoff at and reverse if they could? The evidence that our metaphysics and ethics can be objective rather than subjective social constructs is that we can see the rightness of things that do not suit us. Let my people go, said Moses to Pharaoh. Why? because it was objectively right and just. Even Pharaoh had the capacity because he had a human soul to recognize it, even though he did not in the end choose to uphold it. We conform to these truths. We do not conform them to us. That is the evidence that there is a transcendent human soul and that only humans have it. If there were one objective reality, just one, mathematical, logical, ethical, aesthetic, valuative, that would be enough to establish that transcendence of the human soul is real. But there are so many. When our eyes are open to it, we can see that wisdom 
is constantly directing humans to it. Transcendent reality shoots through and imbues all of nature. It is everywhere if we would just see it. That is why Plato is depicted. That is why Plato depicts his teacher Socrates as a mystic. He saw transcendent truth all around him and was willing to give his life for it. I'd like to make a closing remark about Carol Wojtyla and personalism. We just completed our glimpse at the personalism of John Paul II. To be clear, personalism is an interfaith, interdisciplinary project. Victor Frankl, the famous Jewish survivor of Auschwitz, is a personalist, and Man's Search for Meaning is a text I highly recommend that you all read. Jews, atheists, and people from all traditions have contributed to the personalist endeavor to identify wherein human dignity lies. We chose a Catholic approach, but to be sure, there are others. As we saw, the way that John Paul II approaches it is to look at the term person and unpack its meaning, identifying what distinguishes persons from homo sapiens, same beings, but two different ways of understanding them. He says that we have an interior life that is marked by rationality, free will, and spirituality. He says that in addition to every person being an object in the world, and each person is an object, each person is also a subject, one who is not to be treated as merely a means to an end, but is to be treated with love. Every person deserves love. We are made to love and to be loved. That is our telos. Love for him goes beyond romantic attraction, hormones, and that which is reducible to survival of the species. John Paul II means by love, self-donating love, where donating implies giving. Human persons have the exquisite feature of being fulfilled when they make of themselves a gift to be received in gratitude and respect and honor and even cherishing for having made themselves this gift. This is the personalist answer to what is our telos? Victor Frankl and other personalists um, will all say, interpersonal love. They see a kind of love that is not reducible to neo-Darwinian explanation and that actually defies it. We are biologically programmed to fend for ourselves, fight for our survival, and strengthen ourselves. Nothing could be more antithetical to the drive for survival than self-renunciation. But the personalist claim is that a life of self-renunciation, a whole life of self-renunciation, when in the context of a lifelong, mutually respectful relationship, is the highest call for humans. Paradoxically, it is only when we renounce ourselves and our egoistic drive for superiority and dominance that we have the chance to become filled up. It is in lovingly allowing someone else's best interest to be top of mind that our own best interest stands a chance of becoming actualized. This view to the personalist is metaphysics. It is a description of all of humanity. 
It does not apply only to the person of religious faith. Strangely, it is the key insight that penetrates the mystery of what it means to be human. Find a way to make yourself a gift. In marriage or otherwise, since there are manifold ways of accomplishing it, and you will take the first step on the path of true human fulfillment. That is what it means to be a person. Thank you. Y'all are fantastic. I've really enjoyed teaching you this semester. You're really a tremendous group. Um, I think I've been clear about the final exam. I think, um, I think we're all clear. So what I'll do, unless there, anybody has a question that they think pertains to the whole group, I'll end here. And if anybody has particular questions about the study questions, you can come uh, talk to me in these next 15 minutes or um, I'll be having a, office hours. We'll have to change them because thankfully it was pointed out to me that Dr. Mr. Romes is teaching during the usual two o'clock slot. So I can meet um, before or after that. Just let me know if you want to set up a time. I will be in my office from um, three o'clock, but you all are leaving shortly thereafter. So let me know if you want to meet before the final, but I trust that you will all do very well. And thank you for a great semester.